member and a volunteer at the Merchant's House Museum. I've been a volunteer since Henry Hudson first sells out of the North River, or at least it seems that way. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's very, very important to me, very important to the museum staff and to the volunteers that you're here tonight. For the few of you who don't know what this benefit is about, uh, there has been a long-standing project to tear down the small garage on the lot just ne next to the merchant's house and replace it with a hotel building. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Much appreciated, thank you. Um, we were caught basically unaware uh, of this situation and have been forking out hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal expenses over the past several years, successfully, I might add, fighting this. But it's not over yet. Uh, they, they, uh, the developers have now named the Merchant's House as a respondent in a lawsuit to the city of New York, and it just goes on and on and on. And our exchequer gets lower and lower and lower. Hence, uh, money that we could be devoting towards maintaining the house and finishing uh, some of the installations in some of the rooms, new uh, period carpeting, that sort of thing, is being directed at keeping the house standing. Uh, just to clarify the point, we are not anti-development, but we are anti anything that is going to endanger the structural integrity of the merchant's house. And that's where the issue lies. So your contributions tonight are going directly to the legal fund. Not a penny of it is going into anything else. All the people involved here tonight and all the people who will be singing at the concert at the museum on Friday evening are all volunteering their time so that every dollar counts. Thank you so, so much. Now before I move on, I want to acknowledge a few people. Uh, firstly, our co-sponsors, the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors and the Cooper Union Office of Continuing Education and Public Programs. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, a big uh, uh, round of applause, please, for David Mulkins, who has been so incredibly, incredibly helpful tonight. That's right. Uh, I'd also like to thank the crew at NYU for being so helpful with this and being so excited about this whole project. Uh, also, uh, the Criterion Film Collection that has really jumped on board and assisted us in many ways. The staff, of course, and the volunteers at the Merchant's House. And I just want to mention our corporate sponsors for tonight as well. Uh, the reception sponsors were Bowler Wine, Miserizzi Restaurant, and Stella Artois. Three of my favorite engines. And the raffle sponsors, we'll talk about the raffle uh, in a few moments, are again the Criterion Collection, Film Forum, Mile High Run Club, Soul Cycle, and Quad Cinema. We could not have done this without them. We could not have done this without you. Thank you so, so much. So now we're going to jump right in to um, a little talk I've prepared for you in advance of the film. Uh, show of hands, how many people have seen this film before? All right, it's probably easier if I ask how many people haven't seen this film before. But um, it's a, for those of you who have seen it before, you already know what a masterpiece this film is. And for those of you who haven't, you're in for such a treat. The first time I saw The Heiress, back uh, when it was a silent film, carved in clay, uh, I noticed pretty immediately, uh, in fact, I sort of jumped up the moment that Catherine Roper hits the front staircase, and I said, wait a minute, that's the merchant's house. And there are little telltale signs throughout the entire movie that the merchant's house played a big role in the uh, uh, set design of the film, in the art direction of the film. Now before we talk about that, I want to talk a little bit about the book itself, Washington Square. Henry James, I just love this quote, the only classification of the novel that I can understand is into the interesting and the uninteresting. <laughs> interesting for uh, an author who nowadays is considered more the latter than the former. But I'd say that probably has something to do simply with taste. Uh, Washington Square, uh, the inspiration for the heiress was first published in 1880. 
And uh, James himself sort of uh, poo-pooed the book. He considered it a minor work of his. It's more a novella than a novel. It's a short novel. And uh, years later, when he was compiling a collection of his work, he tried in vain to persuade the publisher to uh, delete Washington Square from the collection. He himself was more interested in his latter works, which tend to be very verbose, for lack of a more, more polite word. Uh, but the heiress is very different from much of his later work in the fact that it's much more direct and has much more of a spin and a thrust to it. And it's, it's really a delightful read, uh, considering its age. And I would recommend that you all pick it up and read it. Now, the question on everybody's lips. Was Gertrude Treadwell the inspiration for Catherine Sloper? Uh, it is a long-standing urban legend that this is the case. This urban legend began after the Merchant's House opened. Uh, Gertrude's history in one sentence or less. Born in the Merchant's House, 29 East 4th Street, nowadays, uh, in the year 1840, died there uh, 93 years later, just shy of her 93rd birthday, uh, basically sealed up very much like a hermit in a house which she preserved as Papa wanted. She was considered quite an eccentric, and many people knew something about her because of this eccentric behavior. When everyone else moved uptown to newer fashionable areas, she stayed put. And she stayed put longer than anybody else which is why the Merchant's House exists today. It is the very last surviving intact structure from that golden antebellum age uh, off of Washington Square in the Bond Street area uh, to survive. And survive means intact inside and out. Those of you who have never been to the house owe yourself a visit because the Treadwell's possessions are still in the house. It's as if you were stepping back in time and you can really experience what life was like for a wealthy family, and I underscore wealthy, in the years before the Civil War. Now, part of the reason for the legend is that a lot of people apparently were aware of uh, a forbidden love. And for years we talked about Lewis Walton. Dun, dun. Uh, in sort of hushed tones and with rolled eyes because, you know, these old family legends can be quite in inaccurate. But uh, a number, a few years ago, our museum historian, Annie Haddad, who's sitting back there, I can say her, she's hiding right now, um, did some research on the uh, veracity of this story. And she said, well, I want to look up this gentleman named Lewis Walton and find out about him. Uh, and sure enough, she found a photograph which made us at the museum gasp when she shared it with us because it was the mate, the identical photograph, which was in the museum collection and labeled as unidentified man. <laughs> Gertrude kept a photo of Lewis Walton in her possession for the remainder of her life. Now, what was the problem with Lewis Walton? Well. It was multiple problems. First of all, he was studying to be a doctor. He was going to Columbia Medical School, and doctors were not then what uh, they are now on the social ladder. Worse than that, he was a Catholic. <laughs> now, this seems ridiculous to us today, but in the 1860s, Catholics were somewhere between, um, I don't know, Hottentots and then, um, jungle animals, you did not mix with Catholics. In fact, there was a time in New York's history earlier than this when if a Catholic uh, priest ventured out in public in his robes, in his vestments, he w it was actually permissible to shoot him. So this is the, suck, the sort of prejudice against Catholics we were dealing with in the mid-19th century. And then to boot, he was Irish on his mother's side of the family. So this was three strikes against them. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it seems ridiculous to us today, but it was enough to uh, quash this love affair between the two, and apparently it really was a love affair. 
Uh, otherwise, she kept a photo of uh, an unknown man in her possession <laughs> the rest of her life. There are a number of coincidences in the novel besides this forbidden love. We don't believe uh, Dr. Walton was a fortune hunter, as is the case with Morris Townsend in the story. Uh, the first of them, interestingly enough, is that Austin and Catherine in the novel, the mother Catherine, marry in 1820, which was exactly the year that Seabury and Eliza married. So it's just a little odd, but if you do the math, I'm sure uh, other people got married in 1820 as well. <laughs> then, Dr. Sloper moves uptown from his home below Canal Street to get away from burgeoning commerce and industry in 1835, which was the year the Treadwells moved to 4th Street. So that's two co coincidences to consider. Then, described in the book, Sloper purchases a modern home on the corner of Washington Square and 4th Street. Another strange coincidence, and if you look at the ad we have in the museum collection for uh, the, the, the for sale ad for the house that the Treadwells bought, it was described as a modern home, complete with every necessity and luxury. James describes the passage of time in the house sliding into genteel decay with society's abandonment and Catherine choosing to become a shut-in. Now, those of you who know Gertrude Treadwell's story know that this is exactly what happened to her and her three unmarried sisters who remained in the house until Gertrude, being the youngest and the last surviving, passed away in 1933 in a neighborhood that did not resemble by any means the neighborhood she was born in in 1840. And just, just to stretch a point to breaking, I thought it was also interesting that in the novel, Morris Townsend teaches his sister's children Spanish. Now, Lewis Walton's first name was spelled L-U-I-S, Spanish, and he was named after a very good friend of the Walton family, who was? Exactly. Now, this is pushing things. I mean, I, I will admit this, uh, because Gertrude and her three unmarried sisters were not by any means unique in this situation. There were, number one, many, many eccentric people in the Bond Street area in the 19th century, and several other families chose to remain shut up in their houses uh, in the area right into the aughts, the teens, and the 20s of the 20th century. So the Treadwells were not unique in this respect. Uh, as I said before, Gertrude just happened to be the last hanger on, and she held on until a point when her second cousin realized that something was gonna be lost forever and needed to be preserved. So, are these coincidences? Yes, I think so. But um, there certainly is room for doubt. When James himself was asked who the inspiration was for Catherine Sloper, he said that uh, he heard the story of uh, an English woman, he relocated to England in 1869, and lived uh, a great deal of the rest of his life there. He was at a dinner party in London and heard a story of a woman who was heartbroken in love by a suitor who was after her money, and she shut herself in and refused to come out into the world any longer. Sounds familiar. Uh, now, is this story true, or was he just carrying, uh, covering up for one of his own? The Treadwells were New York aristocracy. His family was very high up in society. I'm just gonna leave it out there and say, I don't think it's true, but if you do, I will not argue. <laughs> Treadwells would have been known to James Circle while he lived in New York, at least anecdotally, but still, it seems like a big stretch. He couldn't have known all of these facts, or could he? <laughs> anyway, Washington Square was first published in 1880. It was a tremendous success, remained a success, uh, never fell out of fashion, and in the 1940s, Augustus and Ruth Getz, I keep wanting to pronounce it the German way, Getz, wrote a marvelous play, which has been revived several times on Broadway. Uh, it opened for its first run September 29th, 1947, ran for 410 performances, and Paramount leapt in and grabbed it because they saw the makings of a great film. And so Paramount produced the film in 1949 with Olivia de Havilland, 
Montgomery Clift, Ralph Richardson, Miriam Hopkins, wonderful, wonderful, terrific actors. Vanessa Brown, Mona Freeman, Ray Collins, Betty Lindley, Selena Royal, all playing the important parts in the film. And luckily for us, William Wyler was engaged to direct it, and the Getzes were engaged to adapt their play to the screen. You are going to see a marvelous, marvelous film, witnessed by the fact that it received eight Academy Award nominations. It was nominated for Best Picture, but All the King's Men won. It was uh, nominated for Best Director, but Joe Mankiewicz won for Letter to Three Wives. This is a better film. Uh, but Dean Jagger won for Best Supporting Actor for 12 O'Clock High. That would have been Ralph Richardson's nomination. And Best Cinematography for Black and White went to Paul C. Vogel for ba Battleground. But Olivia de Havilland won as Best Actress. John Meehan, Harry Horner, and Emile Curry won for Best Art and Set Direction. Edith Head and Giles Steele won for Best Costumes. And Aaron Copeland won for that marvelous, marvelous score. Now we're gonna talk about Harry Horner again in just a few moments. But let's move on to some of the evidence I unearthed on my own when I first sat up in the chair and saw that Newell post and said, that's the Merchant's House. There's the Newell post. Now, take a good look at it. That is the Newell Post in situ at the Merchant's House, photograph taken in 2007. And now remember what it looked like, because there it is, almost line for line in the movie. The elements in the Merchant's House were Hollywoodized. They were made larger, the single front door was made a double front door, yada, yada, yada. But I don't know of another Newell Post in New York City that looks like that. <laughs> Note the back staircase. Those of you who were in the museum today uh, and took the tour of the house, you probably noted that you walked up from the basement level, the kitchen level, to the parlor level on this staircase. In particular, take a good look at that newel post and just the way it's configured. Here is a still I extracted from the film. There it is. And you'll notice even up above the staircase has the same balusters and the same decorative scroll work on the risers, just like the merchant's house. But here's the clincher. This is a newel post which is not original to the house. In the 1870s, Gertrude's sister Sarah had a coaching accident and she injured her spine, so the family needed to install an elevator, a hand hoist elevator into the building. To do so, they had to take the staircase to the third floor, to the children's bedroom floor, pull it forward and twist it around and added this 1870s newel post to an 1832 house. That's what it looks like at the top of the stairs today. If you look up that flight of stairs, you'll see the newel post very clearly silhouetted against the lights of the third floor, the children's bedroom floor. And there it is in the heiress. There's only one house in the world that has that Newell Post in that position in an 1832 house, and it's the Merchant's House. So, thank you. So at that point, I felt very justified, and you could just go on and on and on and see the examples, the mantle. Don't look at the handsome man, look at the man. <laughs> now, again, our historian Annie Haddad, just last week, where were you in 2007, when I, when I first put this talk together, she found an extract, she found an article by Norman Gamble called Harry Horner's Design Program for the Heiress. This was from Art Journal, uh, 1983. And he writes, as you can all read, the research notebooks contain photographs by Horner of architectural details from the Washington Square area. In addition to such Greek revivals detailed as quoted in the film, The Treadwell House, a museum made out of a typical residence was especially important. To Horner, this museum evoked the life of the story, thus its interior decor was a significant influence in the film's design. And this is based on an interview that Norman Gamble had with Harry Horner at Horner's house in Pacific Palisades in 1978. And then I received an email from Annie just two days ago saying, I found another one from Designing the Heiress, written by Harry Horner for the Hollywood Quarterly in autumn of 1955. 
This is a quote from Harry Horner, the art director who won the Academy Award for the heiress. I wandered through backyards of houses and saw those gardens and dwellings along the mews which once represented the stables and the elegant places on Washington Square. Here I picked up a detail for an iron fence which would express the wealth of Dr. Sloper, and there a stairway which would help to dramatize Catherine's last climb up the stairs. Wandering through this early city, meaning the area around Washington Square, I hit upon such lovely museum pieces at the Treadwell House, an example of the typical residence of a rich merchant. So, I felt very justified when those two quotes, thank you Annie, appeared. So, now, moving right along, we have two very special guests with us here tonight, and I'm going to read their bio, bios, and then ask, us, ask them to join us on the stage. First, we have Judy Getz Sanger, who is the daughter of the Getzes, the playwrights and screen, screenplay writers. Judy Getz Sanger has acted as her parents' representative, called the author's representative in theater programs for most of her adult life. After her father Gus's death, his closest friends, George S. Kaufman, S.J. Perlman, and Al Hirschfeld, became her stand-in godfathers. This is uh, their parents, her parents, by the way, on either side of William Wyler in the middle of this photo. This is taken on the set of the heirs, by the way. And along with her mother Ruth's influence, there was not much chance of her not becoming a writer. Quite a good writer, I should say. She married in England at a young age, had a daughter, and became a poet, published in journals, and later a playwright. Her book of poetry, Love in Our Language, is available on Amazon. Love in Our Language. A musical based on it is in development, and her play, Close Harmony, is being considered for production. She is in the middle of writing a family theater memoir called Spirits of the Staircase. And she added as an aside, the Getz's granddaughter, Katie Firth Bank, is an actor in New York married to Jonathan Bank, who runs the Mint Theater. The Bank's 10-year-old son, Theo Goodman, the Getz's great-grandson, is already an avid theater goer. So all four generations are always delighted to see the Slopers back on the silver screen or stages all over the world. And accompanying her, she'll be coming up on the stage momentarily, is Catherine Weiler, uh, William Weiler's daughter. And I might add that another uh, child of his, Melanie Weiler, is seated right back there in the house. You could just wave. There she is. Wave some more, Melanie. <laughs> Great, thanks. About Catherine, she's an independent producer of film and television, including the feature film Memphis Bell, based on her father's celebrated World War II documentary, Memphis Bell. She is currently executive producer of the restoration of that documentary and of The Cold Blue, a new film made from the 15 hours of outtakes of the original documentary, which were found last year at the National Archives. The Cold Blue premieres on HBO on June 6th, which is, exactly, the 75th anniversary of D-Day. She has also been a senior vice president of production at Columbia Pictures and held leadership positions at the National Endowment for the Arts and PBS. Judy, Kathy, please join us on the stage. The mic. Willie, Willie and Tally Weiler, Kathy and Melanie's parents, who I adored, uh, were extraordinary people. And they became very close friends with my parents. And Willie had 
a very uh, idiosyncratic, wonderful personal question that he would ask people. Somebody would tell him a story, and this was like a marvelous movie, and I don't know. And, and, and Willie would say, hmm, that's very interesting. That's a great story. I'm so glad you told me. That's one. Why does it need to be a movie? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And uh, in fact, Olivia, you'll talk about Olivia, them coming to New York to see. They came to New York to see the play. But in fact, Gus really had to sell Willie on the idea of why this supposedly unfilmable James, James story should be turned into the movie. And it was because the guesses felt that Willie's adding oxygen uh, and the world, taking the story outside of the living room, taking it into into the world would make it much more poignant that you couldn't say to yourself, oh, this is just one neurotic cruel father and one hurt, heartbroken daughter. But the minute Willie took it out and made it be, it could be any of us, it could be any family, his camera, when, it, when Austin Slater takes his daughter to a family party and Willie's camera starts at the party shoes of Monty Cliff camera works up. Oh, it's, it's one of the great shots of movie making. Do you want to talk about Olivia and the movie a little bit? Um, well, I think that uh, I can tell you I, I uh, was very interested in the fact that actually it was Olivia who suggested to my father that he should get, get this uh, play, get the rights, and because it was so perfect for her, and I just love the fact that she was smart enough to realize that he would be such a good director. Yeah. And uh, then, of course, he had to talk Paramount into getting it and hiring Ruth and Gus, which uh, Ruth and Gus did not go for the first uh, the, the first offer. No. And uh, Herb Swifty was so hard. And, and, and said, you know, well, are, are we going to be sure that we're going to write the adaptation? And Willie said, well, absolutely. Not going to let anybody else who doesn't know this material deal with it. And so they finally all worked it out. Um, One thing I want us both to say about this story, which I find so touching. I mean, the play is uh, 72 years old. And it just had a wonderful revival at the arena stage in Washington. And it was done in the round. And there's a moment, of, a moment in the play, which is also the movie that you will see. A man sitting behind me, who was probably 24, Catherine Slover says something. And he, the man behind me stood up and went, Right on, Catherine! <laughs> that fertile and that yielding so much awareness. Is In fact, I read somewhere that in 1993, Mike Nichols and Tom Cruise talked about doing a remake. And they ran the film. And they decided that it was perfect. And they shouldn't touch it. <laughs> So there, there is a great story about uh, that Olivia, Olivia and I are friends. And I have to tell you that she will be 103 on July the 1st. <laughs> she and my father shared the same birthday, July the 1st, which so why I've always remembered it. But uh, she once told me that, uh, you know, Ralph, getting Ralph Richardson, who was playing uh, the father in London, was rather a coup. And uh, I think, I'm not sure whether he was Mr. Bus or what it was, but when I asked her, Olivia, what was it like uh, working with Ralph Richardson, she said, oh, he was a glove snapper. Glove <laughs> <laughs> snapper? She said, yes, we had a scene together where he had no lines. Mm -hmm. And as I was talking, he kept slapping his gloves <laughs> on his upper arm. <laughs> I can't, this is impossible, I can't deal with this. 
And Willie said, don't worry, Olivia. The camera's not showing that. We'll get rid of the sound. Everything will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing that Kathy and I also talked about, and it shows you a little bit how what a genius really was at these things. And also, my parents, they were very close friends. And they decided, Willie, I think, said that he wanted Ruth and Gus to play every day, good cop, bad cop. And the, between the three of them, one of them had to make sure that at the end of the day, Olivia would be in tears. But at one point during the day, not seriously, not to make her ugly, but just some tears, some heartbreak that they would criticize, do something, say something, and then the other one would comfort her. And they did this for all through the shooting of the picture so that she would just always leave work that day wondering if she'd made a mistake, if she'd done something wrong, if she really wasn't pretty enough, oh Christ, what, what's going to be with my hair? What if I should, I shouldn't have answered him that way? Oh, no. And guess what? the performance of her life, because you see that doubt and that heartbreak in this woman's face all through the picture. And I once said to my father, why did you give her that horrible hairdo? <laughs> and he said, it's very hard to make a woman like Olivia plain. <laughs> we have to cut it off now. Oh, I'm so pleased you came. And Into the mic. The, the merchant's <laughs> house is one of the great jewels of the town. And in the beginning of the picture, you'll see that the day that Mark Johnson goes to, to call on her, she's not there. And he think, she goes in and he says, I, I thought you were, I was waiting, I've been waiting. And when I didn't think you were, she said, I have to come home sometime. I live here. And that's what you feel every time you come into the house. Thank you so much. Thank you.